Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the last seminar of this quarter. Uh, uh, so today the speaker is uh, Dr. David Jackson from SNAC. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, a great version of this community package called PLT. So high pass sense is a high performance measure release of PLT. And uh, just a uh, quick reminder that you know these are the presentations of this quarter, and they are all they have all been recorded. You can uh, go to the Bits and Walls website and find the link, or you can just simply search uh, on YouTube. The presentation for today should be available in a few days. So our speaker today is David, uh, Dr. David Jackson. He manages the Gizmo Group at Slack. And uh, he leads the uh, research and development activities in renewable energy and grid integration systems. Before joining Slack, he was a staff scientist at PNNL, which is a national lab uh, in Oregon or in Washington. Washington. In Washington. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, over there, he led the development of building energy modeling, control, and diagnostic systems. He designed the Olympic and Columbus transaction. Transactive energy price discovery system to manage the development of PLT for the US Department of Energy. His research focuses on the control and dispatch of fast and heat demand response, retail, real time, demand dispatch, use of prices, and transactive control. Okay, thanks, Jim. So, thanks everybody. I know this is the, uh, well, actually, yesterday was the last day, so I know this is like, you're not even supposed to be here. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, sorry for last week. Um, I forgot that I had a vacation planned and I was in Montana all of, all of basically the end of last week, the beginning of this week. It was a great vacation, so I'm all recovered and I'm ready to go for the whole summer, right? Okay, so um, so yeah, what, I, what I'll talk about today is this tool that we developed uh, for the California Energy Commission. Um, I'm going to spend a little time on the history of the tool. I think it's instructive to know, you know, where it came from and why uh, the California Energy Commission was interested in using this tool um, and seeing it uh, developed further and made uh, available to uh, utilities and uh, the CPUC and CEC uh, in California. And then I'll talk about, you know, sort of some use cases, things that we uh, uh, we focused our attention on in development of uh, this particular version of GridLabD and some of the features that we added to it. Um, there's quite a bit of changes from the original version that was developed for DOE. And, uh, and then just spend a few minutes on sort of things we're looking at doing going forward, um, you know, emerging uh, ideas and uh, directions that we'd like to take the tool in, and hopefully we'll be successful in raising the funding necessary to, to do that research. Um, so let me just start off with the origin of the tool. Um, so the national laboratories have what's called the Laboratory Directed Research and Development Program that they've been running since the early 90s, where the, the laboratory can take a portion of the, uh, the money that they make from conducting research for the Department of Energy and they can invest it in early concepts development uh, uh, projects. And uh, so GridLab D had its origin in one of these LDRD projects um, 20 years ago. Um, and uh, so I led a very small team, uh, very small, it was me and one other person. <laughs> um, and uh, we basically focused on the problem of simulating buildings and power grids at the same time. Now, if you think about it, that problem um, is not trivial. Power grids behave on the order of microseconds, typically. That's where we really think about problems on the power system. And buildings behave on the order of minutes to hours. So if you're thinking about how you slow down the simulation of a power grid to incorporate behavior that happened on the order of minutes to hours, and you speed up buildings so that you can start to simulate them at the same time, that's not an easy thing to do. At the time, most of the building energy simulations were energy focused. So they looked at how much energy a building consumed hour to hour, but they didn't really think about what happened sub-hourly. You know, if I have a demand response program and I want to change the thermostat and look at how the building's behavior changes within the hour, you couldn't do that with those tools. It was impossible. At the same time, the power system uh, tools that existed either did dynamics, which is, you know, microseconds 
uh, milliseconds time, time scales, or they did steady state. So there was no time scale in between that we really thought about. So bringing these two together so that we could study how demand response and power grids and distributed energy resources and smart grid technology would work, that was a huge problem and hadn't been solved. Uh, the approach that we took be, eventually became this tool that we developed for, um, for the Department of Energy and it became a whole program at DOE. Um, and it's based on an agent-based uh, approach where instead of trying to take these two different solvers that were fundamentally incompatible, um, you know, there's just no way to connect them together. They, they dealt with different state space. Uh, the dynamics were on time scales that were completely incompatible and irreconcilable. And instead we built an agent-based system where different objects exhibited behaviors and then the tool essentially created the solver needed to make these objects work together on the fly. Um, and so it would generate the solution for the power system and it would generate the solution for the buildings. And then it would try to solve them on time scales that were relatively uh, compatible with, with each other by doing things like asking a building, how long before you have a state change? or asking the power system, how long before a fuse blows, things like that. Um, and by creating an agent-based system, we had an, uh, an environment which we could study the kinds of things that DOE was really interested in looking at at the time. And a lot of these things have become sort of canonical problems for agent-based uh, simulators and answered some important questions. And uh, I'll go over some of these. You know, there were a lot of questions around uh, whether conservation voltage reduction actually was effective. Um, for those of you who don't know, conservation voltage reduction is the idea that if I have an impedance load and I reduce the voltage, then presumably I reduce the power. And, and it can be very effective. The question DOE was asking is, does that always work? Right? Does reducing the voltage necessarily result in less power, given the fact that buildings have thermostatically controlled uh, thermostatic control systems? And so if I reduce the power, I may actually increase the runtime and I get a no wind. So these are the kinds of questions that we were asking. We didn't really have the tools necessary to answer them. Uh, they were also asking questions about whether retail real-time pricing was feasible um, using buildings. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of work around distributed energy resources that was beginning to emerge at the time. Obviously, now it's a central focus of what we do. Transactive control, for those of you who know about transactive energy, the idea that we use prices um, as a signal for controls. Um, if I tell you that your electricity is more expensive in the next 15 minutes, you might change your behavior in the next 15 minutes. Um, and then a lot of work related to um, what came to be known as fault-induced delayed voltage recovery. Uh, the idea that if there's a fault on the system and we have uh, loads that have um, uh, inertia, motor loads that have certain varying inertias, they may actually cause uh, voltage sags that would cause a cascade of motor stalls and uh, these motor cells would drag the whole system down. Um, and then of course, microgrids. Um, and so I'll go through some of these. I don't have time to cover them all, but I'll, I'll go through some of the results that came out of the early work on this tool. Um, so uh, conservation voltage reduction, this is the idea that not all feeders are created equally. Um, and uh, so what this study did is looked at how a, a taxonomy, a set of taxonomy feeders, 25 feeders that were drawn from across the United States, um, and we knew based on that taxonomy, how many feeders uh, that each particular design represented across the US. And so we had a weighting model that allowed us based on the simulation of those 25 feeders to project across the US, um, how many feeders it would be productive to implement conservation voltage reduction. Um, and so the idea is that some feeders it's very effective and others not so much. And so we would focus CVR strategies on the ones where it was very effective. Um, this gave you sort of a cumulative distribution of the impact of implementing CVR uh, across the US. And what we found is that if we did it on about 35% of the feeders, we might get 80% of the benefits. Um, and so obviously that was an important uh, insight for utilities and utilities typically now use this kind of modeling to determine whether it's uh, effective uh, to implement CVR. We've got a good load model, we've got a good network model, we put the two together and we can determine whether uh, voltage reduction is actually going to result in energy savings. Um, another area of work was this idea of using retail real-time pricing. So if we um, 
use price discovery mechanisms on the retail side. We ask people what their willingness to pay is. Um, rather, we ask the devices that they use what the willingness to pay is. Um, and through automation, we can then um, discover the price at which supply is equal to demand given a constraint on the distribution feeder. Um, does that result in uh, performance improvements? Particularly, does it mean that we uh, manage our constraint better? Um, and uh, so this was a test uh, using a simulation of a double auction. Um, and what you see is that the, the impact on the thermostat settings was not significant. You don't see a major difference in the, uh, in the comfort. Um, but through this price discovery mechanism, you can see the price is spiking up a little bit during the, uh, the peak time of the day. We can see a, uh, the system does a better job of managing a constraint here about 5.2 uh, megawatts on this particular distribution feeder. Um, so it's this kind of tool that lets us do this. The most recent study that came out of uh, uh, using GoodLab D came from PNNL was this uh, study of ERCOT. This is the Texas uh, interconnection. It was called the DSO plus T, basically looking at if we were using transactive energy uh, strategy um, on a distribution system across Texas, would there be uh, benefits, cost benefits to the consumers in Texas? Uh, they started this before things went haywire last, um, last spring. Um, and I actually don't know what their conclusions were uh, based on what they saw uh, during the uh, winter storms last, not this past spring, last year in 2021. Um, but the idea was to look at a, a simulation starting throughout the entire system. So basically they simulated the entire Texas system uh, using GridLab D and a number of other tools uh, in a co-simulation environment. Um, the idea being to, to see whether um, employing a, a sort of a retail level price discovery mechanism would result in savings. Um, this is just the baseline you know, cost flow through the system, um, identifying where the costs, uh, where, where consumers' expenditures end up um, uh, sort of in the supply chain and distribution uh, at, at ERCOT. And this is pretty close to what the national results are for a moderate renewables uh, system. And the result was that they found that there's a um, pretty significant advantage to the consumers if, um, uh, if they use battery storage um, and dispatch it using a transactive like mechanism. Um, and probably the largest benefits are in the capacity payments, uh, which seems sort of obvious. Um, and I think you know, the, the main purpose of this was not just to validate what was obvious, but to try to get a sense of the magnitude of the savings and the net benefits that we would see um, in a system like ERCOT. Um, and then, uh, so as a result of this work, um, the California Energy Commission was uh, keen, uh, and then actually I have to credit one person in particular, it was Jamie Patterson, um, who I think was the strongest advocate for this at the CEC. I'm really keen to see um, whether we could upgrade the tool to meet some of the challenges that they anticipated uh, coming in California. Uh, particularly in response to climate change policies, um, and then more recently, uh, extreme weather events and uh, the problems and challenges of managing distribution systems uh, under these conditions. Um, and so it was this early thinking at CEC um, that led to the program that uh, I'm going to talk about. And this is the work that we've been doing over the past five years. Um, so CEC was motivated um, to meet. Uh, uh, to basically support the DRP process in California, uh, which is guided by these basic principles, you know, ensuring uh, customer choice and engagement, um, recognizing the role of all the distribution assets that are on the system in uh, California's carbon management um, uh, strategy. Uh, of course, addressing safety, reliability, and resilience itself in the system, um, which is an ongoing and growing challenge, um, not just in California, but Pretty much everywhere now, um, and you know, ensuring that we have an affordable system, um, and uh, ensuring that we equitably allocate the costs of managing the system and uh, meeting uh, all of these goals, and then of course, uh, employing a, a competitive process um, when we do select DERs, um, so that we don't uh, unnecessarily, um, you know, uh, incur costs that eventually inevitably get passed on to the consumers. Um, so it was this sort of these guiding principles that led to 
uh, the work that we proposed. Um, when we proposed the work, we recognized that there were a whole bunch of challenges that we had to address in the tool. The, the, essentially, the tool had to simulate all of the conditions and circumstances that would be a concern to utilities. Um, so early on, of course, hosting capacity and lo locational net benefit analysis was considered extremely important. In fact, those were the only two use cases that were identified at the outset of the project in 2016. Locational net benefits analysis kind of fell by the wayside. Um, what happened was that the, uh, the work that was done generating the map, the LNBA maps, um, was regarded as pretty much comp well, comprehensive and uh, there was no need to revisit it any, anytime soon. Um, and so there was no, there was really, we basically gave up on working on that early on on the project. But hosting capacity or what was called uh, integration capacity analysis stayed. And a couple of other use cases were added, which I'll get to in a second. Then, of course, you know the issues that utilities have with uh, DRP in general um, remained. Um, so, you know, the, the importance of being able to demonstrate technologies in the field and at scale um, has always been something that uh, that utilities have had to deal with. Um, but of course, you know, emerging uh, problems. We've been having issues now with data uh, access. Uh, who owns the data it seems to be something of a question that doesn't uh, ever seem to get resolved. Um, you know, the, in principle, consumers own their data, but I don't know if you've ever tried to get your data. Um, it's not as easy as you might imagine. Um, and uh, of course, using that data productively in analysis, uh, the utilities have the data but lack the tools. Uh, many of the people who have the tools lack access to the data. Um, so this has been a real issue. Uh, and it's an ongoing issue. Um, and then uh, tariff design. So a lot of these new technologies, whether we're talking about transactive or uh, you know the emerging technology of batteries, these challenge the tariffs that we are accustomed to seeing uh, utilities use. And so they need tools to help them analyze these tariffs, the tariffs that they're using in the context of uh, these new technologies. And so a lot of the design work that we've been doing in the tool has been focused on answering that question as well. Um, and then, of course, life safety, uh, especially with uh, PSPS uh, work being done, uh, utility are developing methodologies to address uh, power safety shutoffs. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the methodologies for that, I think, still need work. Um, there's really no standard way of addressing that question, and it's something that we've been working on. So there's been this evolution in the tools. Um, in fact, I would argue it's less of an evolution, more just emerging new tools that are ultimately going to displace the existing tools. Historically, utilities focused on low growth, the reliability assets, and on a system that was pretty, pretty static. Not, it didn't change very quickly. If you think about the difference between the system in the late, uh, late 60s, early 70s, and the system in the, you know, before the 2000s, um, that was pretty, pretty much the same system didn't really change fundamentally. But then a lot of changes started to happen. And, um, and so, you know, we have to really rethink the tools um, in some ways. Uh, there are certain tools that are just gonna disappear um, and other tools that are going to have to be developed to meet these new needs. Um, and uh, one of the biggest challenges we've run into is that historical data just doesn't seem to work anymore. Um, and so we rely far more on models of what we think is going to happen rather than data um, from, uh, from what, the way the system worked in the past. And if we do rely on data, it's not gonna be a lot of data. And it's gonna be data about a system that's fast changing. Um, so we have to augment the models with physics um, and deal with uncertainty in a, much, uh, in a much more comprehensive way than we have in the past. And that's been a big challenge. Um, so here are the resources that we've been using uh, or dealing with in our modeling uh, to try to address these, these issues. Uh, demand response obviously remains a very important component um, and has basically for the last 20 years. Um, and of course, you know, so that involves tariff design uh, questions. You know, when you introduce a, a time of use tariff, how do you know that it's going to be effective? Um, do you rely on simulations um, in part to, to examine that? Uh, and, uh, and so we've introduced methodologies to, to include tariff calculations and tariff modeling in the tool. Uh, weatherization efficiency programs. Um, all of these have been around in the DRP process for a long time. Um, 
But uh, solar and energy storage, and, uh, and of course now decarbonization, electrification of the of our, our energy infrastructure are all emerging as important uh, dimensions of uh, of the problem, and the tools have to address this. Um, so uh, just briefly, um, you're probably familiar with all of these. Uh, so demand response, this is the idea that you can change the shape of the load, you can shift the load, you can reduce the load by shedding some of it, or you can whittle the load back and forth in a way that just happens to meet some particular need. If, uh, they call it shimmy just because they like their, uh, the, uh, what's the word for things that sound like alliteration. Um, and uh, so uh, for demand response, uh, obviously thermostat setbacks and time of use rates have a very important role, um, but there's also uh, you know, a lot of programs relate, that use water heaters um, to, uh, to reduce load. That tends to be effective, obviously, only on uh, where there's electric water heaters. And so if you have gas water heaters, that's not obviously a, uh, a program that's um, of any relevance. Um, but as we transition from uh, resistance water heaters to heat pump water heaters, uh, the magnitude of that program's contribution to uh, demand response might reduce pretty significantly. Um, and, and its behavior might change. Uh, and then of course, you know, the energy efficiency of buildings, uh, the loads in the buildings uh, can all have a significant impact on the effectiveness of DR programs. And so we have the ability to model uh, these devices, the appliances and the equipment in the buildings and evaluate whether the DR programs have been affected by this um, in any way. Um, solar impact, uh, solar resources impacts, obviously with more uh, solar showing up in the system, this has become a very important element of what we look at when we run the simulations. Um, you know, it introduces a lot of uncertainty. Uh, that uncertainty uh, turns out for obvious reasons to be highly correlated with thermal load. Um, you know, your highest cooling load is also when you have the highest uh, solar uh, capability, but it's also when you have the highest solar uncertainty. Um, the solar is a lot less uncertain when it's not there, um, when, you know, when it's night or something. So uh, that correlation is something that's difficult to capture um, with simple uh, power system modeling tools. But when you have a joint uh, thermal building load and uh, a power system load, you can um, do a much better job of seeing how those two interact with each other. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the power system side of the simulation does a really good job of um, capturing the effect of variability in the load and the solar on the voltage in the system and whether uh, that increases the uh, amount of operation of the regulators and load tap changers and devices that have to manage the voltage uh, on the grid. And so there, those are all results that we have to capture and, and utilities are very keen to know um, the degree to which adding um, solar affects their uh, assets and whether they need to upgrade the capabilities of their systems. Uh, and then of course, from a price perspective, uh, solar has some pretty significant impacts. Uh, energy storage is also an important uh, component uh, of the uh, resource mix that we are talking about here. And, um, you know, that's also modeled in these systems. In some jurisdictions, energy storage requires solar. So if you're going to put a battery in your house, you must also put a solar unit. That's not true everywhere, but I believe it's true everywhere in California. I'm not positive about that, but um, I think it is. Um, and so energy storage has significant impact. And we capture that, those effects in the simulations. And then low decarbonization, the transition of um, end uses, which have been traditionally um, at least in part met with gas, natural gas, so heating, cooking, clothes drying, um, uh, and things like that, uh, hot water heaters, um, as well as the electrification of transportation, the addition of electric vehicle chargers um, on the distribution system. Those all have a pretty significant impact on the, uh, the ability of the system to meet the demand. Um, and in some cases, you know, we see the impact of the load doubling or more, um, depending on how much was already natural gas uh, or how much was natural gas versus how much was already electric. Um, the interesting part about this is this is not just a problem for the power system, the grid itself. It's also a problem for homes. Um, if you have a lot of gas loads in your home, your uh, power, your electric panel 
very likely doesn't have a capacity to support changing all of that over to electricity without an upgrade. Um, and those upgrades can be fairly expensive. And so the idea that we're going to decarbonize um, our entire, let's say our entire residential system and shift all the residences from gas to electric um, is not as easy as it might seem uh, because so many homes might require significant electrical upgrades and there just isn't enough you know, labor capacity out there to do that in such a short amount of time. Um, and uh, so that's, it's a real challenge that I think has to be um, understood and, and uh, utility to think carefully about how they, how they support um, the transition away from natural gas in the building, uh, in both commercial and residential buildings. <coughs> um, and then of course, uh, you know, Grid Lefty has a lot of the capabilities already in place. Um, the DOE version already did these quasi steady state time series that were required to do these kinds of studies. Um, and so a lot of the tools were already in place, um, but there were certain things that were missing. So for example, when we were looking at um, uh, things related to tariff, there's no tariff model. In fact, there's, there isn't really a tariff model at all. Um, anywhere. So what we had to do was uh, go to an NRL database where tariffs were represented um, and try to construct a model that would allow us to study the effect of tariffs on uh, revenue for the utility and of course the costs for the consumers and how these new technologies would have to be incorporated into tariffs and, and how you might structure tariffs in a way to deal with, um, with some of these new and emerging uh, DERs. Um, the other thing that's missing is in Grid Lab D, or at least was in the DOE version, um, it only supported what are called the IEEE 1566 metrics. These are reliability metrics. You've probably heard of terms like SADI, SAFI. Um, these, are, these are metrics that measure uh, the impact of outages on the loads, um, but it doesn't measure them in ways that are particularly useful if you're talking about things like resilience or the effect of solar and battery technology on the consumer. Um, if a consumer has um, a battery in a solar unit and they can run autonomously for some number of days, then the impact of disconnecting them from the system is very different than it would be for a consumer that doesn't have those technologies. And these metrics that exist right now um, that are used essentially ignore that difference. And so part of the work that we've been doing is trying to understand what kind of metrics do we need to really um, understand the difference between uh, the impact difference that we see between a consumer that has these kinds of distributed resources versus a customer that does not. Um, and so we've been working on some of those questions, uh, trying to deal with that. So this is this is what CEC has been funding the enhancements uh, for us to do. Um, so the hosting capacity analysis was in there originally. Electrification impacts analysis, they're very keen to see us support that. Uh, tariff design and then the resilience impacts uh, analysis. And I'll talk about, and I'll show you some examples of all of these here in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, and just so you have context, uh, this is not the only project that CEC funded. There's actually, there were uh, several other projects. Um, Glow is actually still underway and being led by Hitachi. Um, and it's basically a user interface for Good Lab D. Uh, the work that we've been doing is basically on the engine and the simulation tool itself. Uh, Hitachi has been working on the user interface that makes the tool um, much more user-friendly uh, than, than it currently is. Um, I would call it extremely user-unfriendly in, uh, in, in its original form. Um, and then uh, Open FIDO is a tool, it's a framework essentially for interoperability and data exchange between uh, various tools, particularly between uh, GridLab D and the simulators and tools that the utilities in California, the IOUs in California use, and specifically Sign and Spite Account and the, these other tools that take care of a lot of the data and simulation um, traditional uh, activities that utilities do with their with their tool suite. Um, so you can think of good ideas sort of complementary to these tools. It provides a, a range of new capabilities. Um, it's not really a substitute for the existing capabilities that you find in Sign or in Spite Account or other tools like that. Um, so OpenFIDO provides a data exchange framework. 
And then um, another project was PowerNet with Markets, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, PowerNet was a project actually led out of uh, Stanford um, for ARPA-E uh, by Ram Rajapal. And then um, there was a, an extension to that project, which was looking at uh, using the transactive technology um, in that framework. And that was done for the CDC. Um, and it used GridLabD as well and contributed some pretty significant enhancements uh, to GridLabD as part of that work. And th those enhancements led into the tariff design work uh, because transactive can be thought of as a tariff. Um, so, uh, you know what, I'm just gonna see what this is not for. Um, so let's, let's just dive into a little bit, some examples of uh, the results that we're getting so far. Um, this work is not complete, so you're seeing the um, work in progress. Um, and so I'll present to you sort of different dimensions of each of these. Um, and I don't have time to cover everything, but I'll, it'll give you a sense of how we're studying the tool and its behavior and its application. So hosting capacity analysis, which is essentially, think of it as an extension to ICA meant to address um, storage and electrification transportation as well. So the, the question is, how much of a particular resource can I add to a distribution system before I hit some kind of limit somewhere? Um, and there are a lot of places in the distribution system where you might encounter a limit. You might encounter it at the feeder itself uh, and overload the uh, cable that comes out of the feeder uh, because it happens to be in a duct bank and there's a thermal limit on the duct bank and you can't move more than you know a thousand amps through that duct bank before the, the wires melt. Um, or you might find that there's a limit on a load tap changer uh, feeder or a voltage regulator. It just can't tap up or down any further than a certain point, you can't add more resources because the voltage deviates too much. Um, uh, another kind of limit that you might encounter is that as the resource turns on and off, the voltage fluctuates too much. And so these kinds of limitations, the thermal limits, the voltage limits, the extreme voltage limits, and the voltage fluctuations are all issues that the ICA methodology was designed to uh, identify. Um, and we extended that to cover not just solar, but also batteries and electric vehicles. Um, and so those capabilities were added to the simulator. Um, so as the solver runs, it also, um, as part of the solution process, explores the limits of the system um, while it's solving the power flow of the solution. Um, and so we ran tests of this methodology on uh, feeders that were provided to us by uh, a utility. Um, the partner in the project. Uh, they provided us with about 2,000 feeders for their entire system. And so we ran these tests on a number of the feeders just to see how well the simulator performs. Um, and so there's a number of, of things that we're obviously concerned with. One is, you know, is the model sufficiently complex that our test is meaningful? Um, and as you can see, you know, we had models, typical model had, you know, somewhere in the low thousands loads on it although one of them had over 7,000 loads. Um, and those loads were you know, allocated to nodes and the, the rough allocation is 1.35 loads per node. If you think about it, that kind of makes sense because you have a tree of nodes. Um, so you, you would expect to see more nodes than there are loads on the system. Um, but that gives you a sense of sort of the complexity of the model that we're dealing with. And then if you look at the runtime performance, you know, it's roughly quadratic as a function of the number of branches on the system. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's not unexpected. Um, you know, so, for example, if, if we have a system with a thousand branches, it would take about a minute to do the ICA analysis. If it had 2,000 branches, it would take about um, four minutes, uh, roughly. So it's, it's not bad. Um, more importantly, um, if you compare running uh, an ICA kind of analysis to running a simple solution without doing the ICA, you would expect it to take longer. How much longer it takes is highly dependent on um, what's going on in the system. So it's not a very simple relationship. You can't just say, oh, well, if I've got a system with a thousand nodes and I run ICA, it's going to take twice as long or four times as long. Um, but what we do see is that there's a, a fairly consistent distribution in the performance. Um, most of, you know, more than 30%, about a third of the models uh, take less than twice as long uh, when the ICA is included in the solver. Um, and then, you know, it sort of goes down from there in a kind of, uh, you know, 
uh, exponential uh, decay. Uh, and none of them took more than 250 times longer. Although I gotta tell you, 250 times longer is a lot. Um, that must have been one nasty model. I don't know which one it is, by the way, but I haven't, I haven't looked. Uh, but what we do find overall, and this is, so we also ran these tests, uh, performance tests on the load forecasting uh, exercise. Um, and what we did find is that compared to the DOE version, the CEC version that we created is way, way, way faster. Um, we just found all of the little tricks and things that we needed um, to make the simulation run a lot quicker um, and also use a lot less storage. Um, again, you know, the DOE version is a research tool and speed uh, and certainly cost and definitely storage were not a factor. Um, but as a production tool, those are extremely important considerations. And you can see that we reduced the runtime um, dramatically uh, for uh, a 2,000 feeder load forecast. Uh, so this is an annual load forecast. Uh, and of course, reduced the cost also very dramatically. And, and reduced the, uh, the storage requirements also pretty significantly, although not nearly as dramatically. Now I got to say, going from $100,000 to less than $25 on AWS, that was, that was something. <laughs> I didn't expect that. I thought it was going to cost like twenty five hundred dollars, um, but you know, choosing just the right um, configuration on uh, on AWS and setting it up, setting up the server in just the right way, took a little trial and error. But once we got it, um, it was really effective. Um, and hats off to the team that did that. Alona, if you're on there, um, nice job. Um, okay, so uh, moving on. Uh, the uh, end use electrification. So this is a pretty straightforward idea. You know, uh, as we switch gas over to electric, what's the impact on the system? Um, and what's the impact on the consumers? Uh, and so this just gives you a quick idea. Here's a test that we did uh, just for a single home. Um, you know, obviously, if you were to extrapolate this for uh, a large number of homes, we would expect to see slightly different or perhaps uh, significantly different results, but this gives us an idea of how the tool is performing because we can inspect that one home and look very precisely at what's going on to see what, see whether it's working properly. And, you know, so what we looked for is, is there a significant shift in the peak time? And what we can see is that it depends where you are. And um, it wasn't a major shift, although we might see a different response depending on uh, the type of home that we're looking at. This is a pretty standard sort of California house with moderately good thermal insulation. Um, and, um, and so, you know, we were extrapolating if we were to switch, uh, you know, 60% of the homes, how much increase of the uh, peak load would we see? And we can see it's not a, exactly a linear, uh, but it's pretty close to, um, and, you know, how much energy increase would you see in electric energy, not total energy? Clear about that. The peak time in LA is uh, not room because you're in the commercial area? Nope. Um, that's a good question. Why would the peak time be one o'clock? I'm assuming that the house had air conditioning, or well, maybe this is one time away. I don't know. Yeah, the, the other obviously. Uh, yeah, the others make a lot more sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the question about the peak time. It, uh, because you're farther south, the solar effects are different. Um, yeah, good question. I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Um, uh, but what you can see is that it's very sensitive to location and pre existing conditions. And so, for example, China Lake, um, I believe it had uh, almost no gas. Um, and so, switching uh, to electric had almost no effect. Um, the other thing that we found that was kind of interesting is that. If we had homes that did not have air conditioning and had gas heating, switched to heat pumps, that introduced air conditioning where there wasn't previously air conditioning. And we would see an excess summer load that wasn't present before, even though there wasn't air conditioning before. And it's because the switchover of the heating system added, added a resource that now was present on the system in the summer. Um, and so it was, it's an interesting question, and I think. You know those kinds of those kind of kinds of unexpected results are not unusual you know, when you use Grid Lab D um, because as an agent-based system, it just the the devices just do what they do. Um, you don't come to it with a presupposition about what they're going to do until it 
you use the models and the models then exhibit behaviors, whatever behaviors they happen to embody. Um, and so that was one interesting outcome. Um, for tariff design, uh, here it's a pretty straightforward idea. You know, as you electrify, as you introduce demand response and other measures, what's the impact on the utility's revenue? What's the impact on the customer's bills? Who, who's paying for it? And how much are they paying for it? Um, and of course, we can introduce new tariffs. We have this nice tariff database from NRO that they maintain that we uh, draw most of our tariff data from, but you could add your own as well. Um, and then of course, the, out, the idea is to output all this in data sheets that the utilities can then use as part of their tariff development and um, uh, design process. So here's an example, oops, too small. Um, here's an example, so the, this, just to give you a sense of the sensitivity of the model, um, this is the electric bill charges as a function of floor area. So, you know, higher floor area, you see, you know, obviously a larger bill. Uh, this is 2,000 square feet, 1,500 square feet. Um, this one looks like it's about $90. It's about 100, $125 per month. Um, uh, the second one is thermal integrity. So a house with pretty good thermal integrity costs less than one uh, that is not so good. And then the bottom one is the heating set point. So obviously if you reduce the heating set point, um, yeah, if you reduce the heating set point, you reduce the cost. Uh, nothing surprising there. Um, you know, obviously the, the main point of this is to compare the tariffs to each other um, for, uh, you know, for different regions within utilities territory. So here's the comparison of three uh, PG&E tariffs in region R. And don't ask me where that is, I don't remember. Um, somewhere in PG&E territory. Um, but you can see that um, as, as you try different tariffs with the same house, you get a different, uh, different uh, cost uh, for the annual uh, electricity bills. Um, and of course, if you were to change how the house behaves, change set points, uh, change how it responds to the TOU, maybe align the set point schedule to the TOU, you might see a an even larger difference. Um, uh, finally, the resilience use case. So this is uh, work that we've been doing for the Department of Energy, um, and it turns it, it turned into a use case. Um, Southern California Edison has been supporting us in this work and uh, helping us test out uh, these uh, resilience analysis tools. Here, the idea originally was focusing on, on extreme weather. So what, if we have high winds, how does that affect the, uh, the power system itself? Um, if a pole is, is down um, or a pole fails or um, we have vegetation contact power lines, um, how does that affect the system? Um, so the current version focuses on the pole failure uh, due to high winds. And then we're currently working on uh, vegetation contact with the lines, vegetation fall. And um, hopefully we'll get to fairly soon, um, you know, interactions with wildfire and so on. Um, and so here's a, just a, a simple example. We tested it out on the 230 kilovolt line that supplies Slack uh, because we have all the detailed information about the line itself. And so this is everywhere where there's a non-zero uh, probability or chance of contact with vegetation given the proximity to the vegetation of the line. Um, and we set it to be hypersensitive to that so that we could, uh, you know, we could tell whether it was working. I think in reality, the right of way is maintained so well that the probability is zero um, everywhere on that, on that line. Uh, but for our testing purposes, we, we did this. Uh, but it gives you an idea of how the results are generated by the tool and how they can be uh, viewed. Um, so in this case, you can see, you know, looking at a single line, we have uh, information about the elevation, um, the height of the trees, the base, the cover, that's the percentage of the area in that uh, region. Uh, that's covered by vegetation, the height of the vegetation, and the, and the line sag. And if these two numbers get too close to each other, that would be considered a probability of contact. Um, and you can see this is they're pretty far apart, but we, uh, we made the five meter clearance um, our criteria so that we can say something. Um, so overall, that's, that's what we've been working on. In the coming months and years, I hope to uh, focus more on some of these issues. Uh, so the first, we've already submitted to, uh, a number of proposals in this area um, in the climate change impact 
Um, so if you think about, you know, as climate uh, in California changes and it becomes, you know, we have more heat waves, we have more, uh, uh, you know, uh, effect from wildfires, uh, more interaction between the, the power system and the vegetation, um, we should expect to see the way the system behaves change. And the question is, how do we capture the impact of those changes on the utilities, on consumers, uh, on the environment? Um, and so we're, we're, we've got a number of proposals that we're putting together to try to um, enhance the tool to make it possible to do those studies um, and really get at some of these questions about the interaction between the environment and the system and, uh, and climate. Um, another one that is, uh, has recently emerged and something that we're interested in is the energy and water nexus. Um, and uh, so here, you can think of this as a, a couple of different ways. The traditional energy water nexus in the utility world is, do I have enough cooling water for my thermal plants? Um, that might not be the way it goes. The, the way, that might not be what's important going forward. Obviously, if we don't have a lot of coal and, uh, um, you know, natural gas plants, thermal is not the issue. What is the issue is, um, you know, the utilities do provide electricity, uh, the energy needed for um, water delivery and waste treatment. And the question is, um, can we do things to make waste treatment and water delivery more efficient? And can we make it so that it is not as sensitive to the availability of electricity uh, going forward? Um, if we, you know, if we have to exercise PSPS more often, um, we obviously have to consider other infrastructures and how they're affected. And so this is, a, this is an area that I think is going to emerge as important and the tool currently really doesn't support uh, that kind of analysis. And I think it's going to be um, Another area that we've been working on a um, fair amount is uh, real-time simulation and developing tools to help with training and testing technologies. Um, so, you know, utility operations are becoming much more complex. Um, it's just not the same kind of system. There's a lot more going on. It's much more dynamic. Um, and so the control room operations at the distribution level is starting to look a lot more like control room operations of transmission. It, there are many dimensions uh, that need to be uh, considered, um, uh, particularly under emergency conditions, bad weather. It can get very chaotic. Um, and when you think about, uh, you know, human operators whose um, fast decision-making skills become essential to the functioning of the system, uh, that starts to bring up some issues about, you know, training and skill and fatigue um, and experience that haven't really typically come up before in distribution system operations. Um, and it's something that we've been looking at. Um, the tools as it exists now does support real-time simulation but it doesn't really have a good framework for um, supporting modeling of operators. And that's something we need to spend some time thinking about. And I think it's a really interesting research area that's emerging for us. Uh, and finally, there's this, uh, all this transactive energy work. Uh, we've got a major project um, in New England um, for which we have to upgrade the simulation. Um, the simulation as it exists today only models retail energy prices. It does not model any other kind of retail price. And the project is actually intended to study um, pricing storage separately from energy. Um, and that's uh, uh, something that we need to work out. So that's an area of current work. So I believe we're working on it. Um, and, uh, and probably uh, will continue uh, to get a lot of focus, uh, particularly with questions emerging about whether transactive energy uh, meets uh, the administration's and I think generally people's expectations for what would be considered um, energy equity and environmental justice uh, goals that we have. Um, you know, does, does pricing energy in a, a sort of a real-time price mechanism um, really get us what we're looking for in terms of, uh, you know, transitioning the system off of uh, carbon intensive resources towards electricity? If electricity turns out to be a lot more expensive um, and requires technologies that are very expensive to implement, well, then you know we may be leaving significant a uh, fraction of the uh, consumer community behind because they simply can't afford it, uh, and that's a major uh, concern, and it's something that needs to be uh, addressed.
And so a lot of the work that we're doing is, is trying to focus on that question, how we can ensure that um, our systems are, uh, are, are more fair uh, and equitable to the consumers. So um, that's about it. Um, I was trying to go quickly because I want to leave time for questions. Um, if you want to find out more about it, the resources are on the internet. Um, we are working with Linux Foundation Energy to deploy and support it as an open source tool. And of course, if you're interested in working with us on this uh, as part of your research or as part of a class project that you might be doing, um, that's my email. You could contact me anytime. Um, there's a bunch of us who do a bunch of different things. And I'm sure I can find somebody that um, uh, you know, could help you out if I can't. Um, and uh, just credit where it's due. Um, this is the result of a huge number of people working on it. I hope I got everybody. I tried to update the list this morning and realized that I was probably still missing a lot of people. Um, but uh, yeah, this has been a, a, an enormous amount of work over the last 20 years. And um, just want to recognize all the people who worked on it recently, especially. So with that, I'm ready for your questions. So there's a question, what are the top three considerations for tariff design? Uh, well, that is not my area of expertise, but I will take my best shot at it. Um, so as a general rule, what utilities try to do when they design a tariff is ensure that the tariff does not um, shift costs inappropriately across customers. There's always going to be some sort of um, what they call cross subsidy where certain customers are gonna be essentially paying for other customers usage. But the difficulty that you have in tariff design is that um, ut utilities costs do not fit very well with how consumers pay for electricity. If you look at your bill, your bill um, essentially says, well, how many kilowatt hours did you use? And we're gonna charge you this much for each kilowatt hour. And uh, that's essentially gonna be your bill. There's also a bunch of fees and, you know, uh, there's a little fixed cost component. But if you look at how a utility actually pays for what they're selling you, it doesn't look anything like that. It's not really a function of how much energy you use. It's a function of how many people do they have how old is their equipment? Where do they source their energy? How much did that source cost, right? There's all these other things that have to somehow be mapped into this nice little clean variable cost function that we present to consumers. And that mapping is not perfect. It's actually profoundly imperfect. Um, and so tariff design is really the art of making that mapping so that it's not particularly unfair to consumers who can't afford um, uh, you know, energy anyway to begin with, right? So, so we don't want to hit uh, low-income consumers um, particularly hard, um, but we also don't want to shift the cost too much onto people who aren't actually paying for it. Another important dimension of uh, tariff design is um, you don't want to you don't want to present people with fixed costs regardless of much, how much energy they use or what their peak is, because if you do, then there's no incentive for them to behave in a way that would be um, conducive to good energy delivery. Let's just put it that way, right? Everybody would be sort of ignore how much they use. They'd leave the lights on, they'd set the thermostats to, you know, whatever is convenient, not what's appropriate. So you do need to expose consumers to some costs and they need to see the effect of their behavior. So the trick is striking that balance. Make it so that they're exposed enough that they respond, but not so much that it becomes deeply unfair and difficult for them to well, survive. Um, and so to me, that's how I see the challenge of tariff design. The way it works is utilities have to um, design a tariff and then submit that tariff for approval. Well, I, I should say this is for investor-owned utilities. This is not true for uh, public utilities. Um, but they have to design a tariff and then submit it for review and approval by the commission. Uh, this is the Public Utility Commission. Um, that process of designing a tariff is tricky, right? So you can't obviously just take all the customers that you have and run a simulation of that. So they pick like a hundred customers that are representative of their customer base and they use that as the basis for doing the analysis. Um, and yeah, it's, it's an art. It's really not as much of a science as you might expect it or hope it to be. 
Um, hopefully that answers your question. Um, yeah. yeah, sorry, I got a follow-up question to that as well. Um, on your point around, I guess, energy poverty, which I, I'm hearing is probably more upon, I guess, in California, where you have solar panels, or they're incentivized to buy solar panels. These are typically your high paying customers who subsidize the poorer customers. You end up with a situation where less and less of those are on the grid. Yep. So, I mean, given that you're kind of within the, the mix of like figuring out this tariff yeah. situation, what is the current like hypothesis as to how you sort of address that, <laughs> that tension? Um, I'm assuming everyone heard the question. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, all right, so the fundamental problem is that the way we've incentivized solar in the past was essentially you know, net meter, right? The idea that um, if I produce excess energy at my home, I run my meter backwards and I get paid the same amount that I would have paid if it had run forward, basically. Um, and I, I don't have to worry about any of the effects on the system of doing that. Um, that's the utilities problem. Um, that's, that's the oversimplified way of thinking about it, but it's fundamentally that's what's going on. Um, obviously the problem with that is that if everybody who can afford to buy solar does so and installs solar, particularly if the, the business model for installing solar is we're going to share the benefits um, with the installer of that meter run backwards, then there's an enormous incentive for uh, over, over design of the solar production um, which the utility has to resist. It has no choice because if the utility has to buy all of its energy at the same price at which it sells it, the utility goes out of business. So it's not sustainable. So you're right. As we transition and more and more consumers are producing electricity, uh, generating electricity at the same price at which they buy electricity, that means that the remaining costs of the utility are shifted onto those who don't do that. And you have this equity problem that emerges. Okay, so what's the hypothesis for how we get out of this? Um, uh, well, one way is to simply stop doing it. Um, and you know, there, there are policy measures that I think are being considered to do that. In some places, it's already underway. Um, I actually think there's, there's perhaps another approach to this, and this is, this is a, at this point, it's a hypothesis, but that um, if we were to use a transactive um, approach, we could get these high-end customers to switch from a tariff that is a net metering tariff to a transactive tariff, get them off of the net metering so that they um, uh, are willing to uh, essentially sell power for what it's truly worth, what people are willing to pay, and not for what the reverse flow will be. It's a hypothesis, it's subject to test, and I'm not super confident that that will work. But I don't have a better idea at this point for a way, a, a way of designing a tariff that would um, get us off of net metering in the long run. Um, I think the problem is that people who have net metering right now feel they're entitled to it. Um, I don't see why they shouldn't feel that way. I don't think it's good policy in the long run, but it was definitely good policy in the short term. And it, you know, did it incentivize a lot of solar? Well, look at the evidence. I think it did. Should we keep doing it? No. <laughs> uh, and then the follow-up to that is you mentioned that within the Credit Lab D, there's there's some tariff simulations that you're doing. Are those, yeah, I'm just curious to understand what are you guys doing related to the tariff implementation? Is it more sensitivity analyses to figure out if you increase time of use tariffs, here's how you can expect the low curves to shift? Yeah. yeah. Um, or is it more you know, the packing calculations? Um, we're not too sure how people are going to use it. I suspect that's how they are going to use it. Um, that's not how we've been testing it. Okay. Um, we, I mean, we do sensitivity analysis, but it's not for, the, for, for that kind of a purpose. Um, at this point, the way we've been testing is we run it and we look at the, num the numbers and see if it makes sense for the buildings that we put in the model. Um, so yeah, we're still in sort of the testing phase of the capability and not looking at how people might use it. But as I think you're right, I think that's, that, that's how people want to use it, is try to understand how, um, how well a tariff is um, responding to a change in the technological mix that you see in the distributed energy resources. So as I add batteries, what happens to the revenue flow? Um, what happens to the customer cost? Is there another one of these shifts occurring? Uh, 
uh, because of arbitrage effects, right? That, the, I think those are the kinds of questions that people want to ask. Uh, so, we'll, so uh, Craig Lewis, we had, there was an earlier question from him asking if the recording will be available and oh, I asked that question. There are the links. And, and he, <laughs> he has a follow up question. Oh, sorry. Oh. I guess yeah. following up on that, um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on the new net energy metering proposal. Um, I know like right now, like NAM 2.0 is what's currently um, like under effect. And I think as I understand it, the like third iteration of net energy metering would be kind of more this transactive setup that you described. But I think it's like kind of tabled indefinitely because it was so politically unpopular. And I was just kind of surprise, curious surprise. <laughs> your thoughts on yeah how to balance kind of what would be technically optimal for or, or like economically optimal almost and like yeah comparing that to like political feasibility and how to kind of go make people be okay with having less benefits. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, let me let me see. I'm not I'm not comfortable enough yet with all the ins and outs of this. I'm going to wait until we can run simulations and then draw my conclusions from that. And we haven't done that yet. So I think I'm going to hold off on answering that one until I can answer it with some insights. Um, I will say I, I, I don't believe the, the transactive solution will be a comprehensive solution. I think it will attract some people, uh, particularly uh, people who have a mix of resources that is very favorable. Um, but if you already have a solar system and you don't have a battery, um, I don't see why you would want to change, honestly. If you have a solar system and, um, so for example, if I, so I believe the current rule is if you have a solar system and you want to put a battery in, that's fine. If you want to put a battery in and you don't have solar, that's not okay. Um, but I could imagine that you could have those rules be more flexible if you were under a transactive tariff, because the issues that those rules are designed to apply uh, to resolve can be addressed by the tariff, because the price signals would ensure that none of those conditions, unfavorable conditions on the system would emerge if they just couldn't. Um, and so you might be able to attract people to, uh, to switch over uh, by relaxing some of the rules that were designed to protect the system. It's behavior otherwise. So I, it's not a great answer to your question, but um, that's, I think, what we want to spend some time studying. Yeah. Um, two quick questions. So I guess the first is, uh, have you guys at all tested this with regards to, micro, tested this with regards to microgrid um, systems? We okay. have at PNL has. Okay. Okay. They've done a lot of microgrid studies. Oh, awesome. And then the second question is, does it consider reactive? Energy power flow. Okay. Yeah. So it's a, it's a the power system model is a three phase unbalanced. Um, it does all the interactions between the lines, um, as well as all the interactions within the devices, um, and it's yeah, obviously reactive power. Okay. Great. Um, and are you able to? So I you know, for quick context, I, I did a project where we're basically looking at how can you use first solar inverters to inject reactive power to yeah. sort of optimize losses. Could you be able to do something like that with that? Absolutely. Yeah, you can change the, the, the relationship between real and reactive power, uh, depending on the device, right? Mm -hmm. Or you could hypothesize a device that does something that hasn't yet been done and implement that in the simulation uh, to see what effect it would have. So you don't even, you're not even restricted to doing something which is physically feasible at the device level. You could just say, okay, well, this is what my load behaves, this is how my load behaves even though there's no such thing in the real world today. Um, so for example, um, you know, there were, there were models of inverters that had control strategies, which you would not actually, but were not available at the time, which now probably are emerging as viable. Uh, but because the, the controller design for the inverter was parametric, you could make it do whatever you wanted. People were trying all sorts of wild things. And uh, some of them were interesting. Um, that's particularly true when you're looking at microgrids where um, you know you have to start to think about grid forming behavior and you know things that you would never really deal with on a normal distribution system. Um, you might change 
Uh, a good example is um, the load model includes what's called grid-friendly appliance, which is a frequency-based load shedding strategy, which turns out you don't you really don't want to do at scale because the gain of that control strategy is enormous and dangerous. It's like it's too much. Um, but it's in there in, in the simulations, and you can turn it on and you can see what it does. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of stuff like that. Yeah. Any more questions from the students? Okay, good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.